This is CBC Here and Now. Came to protest because the Hamadik W is not fit to be on, our, on the Labrador Seas. We, I'm waiting for some housing material. Um, I've been waiting over a month. Shipments delayed, damaged products, residents in Nain protest against their new cargo service. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. We're going to start tonight in Labrador with unhappiness and discontent in Nain over its new freight service. Residents say cargo shipments are slow to come in and when they do, the goods are often damaged. Here now is Jacob Barker joins us live from Nain this evening. So Jacob, what are people going to do about this? Well, Anthony, I can see the Hummetic W pulling off into the distance here. Uh, it just left port, but you better believe when it was in port, a lot of people were talking about what was coming off the boat and how it was coming off the boat. And in the case of one of the sea cans behind me, the shape of what was inside the soda pop that was inside wasn't so good. This sea can was left on the dock in Makovic for quite some time. The soft drinks inside destroyed, product wasted. Frank's supermarket was expecting the shipment for more than a week. Manager Priscilla Millick discovered the frozen goods when she got to the dock today. Yeah. Not a surprise, she said. We knew it was going to be frozen for sure. The pop, yeah. Later, she went back to fill out a claim for damaged goods. Millick says dealing with shipping this year has been a circus. Uh, upset, yeah. Yeah. We get okay. it all frozen and then there's nothing we can really do about it but to send it back on the boat. Yeah. Get a claim for it. Others have been expressing their discontent with the new service. Protesters showed up at the dock last night to show their dismay. I mean, we've had three, sh three or four ships uh, before this in the 60s and 70s, and now this is 2019, and we just had the one ship, and it's not, it's not fit for the Labrador Seas. Find another way to get it here faster, get it here now. We, we've been waiting, people have been waiting for their summer supplies, let alone winter supplies. Back again today, Delays in shipping for some have meant home renovations have had to be put on hold. I'm waiting for uh, windows and doors, and I, I know that the more you, you handle uh, delicate items, the chances are higher of being broken. So I'm, I'm going to go see now if they're over there. So. Yeah. You hope they're on the boat? I hope they're on the boat so I can store them away for the winter because it's too late to replace my windows and doors now. So the Woodward group of companies did address the issues today, calling wind conditions on the coast the most challenging it's had in years. It did say that all grocery items would be delivered by the end of the week. It also acknowledged that some of the cargo coming from Makovic to Nain would be damaged and it would be resolving customers' claims as quickly as it could. Reporting live for Here and Now in Nain, I'm Jacob Barker. You can see uh, by Jacob's piece there, wind not so much a uh, point at the moment, but we do have a couple of systems that are in play over the next couple of days. We'll certainly talk about that, but this afternoon we saw some freezing rain, or at least this morning, we saw some freezing rain through uh, parts of the west coast, and we've got some snow that's accumulating up through the northern peninsula. Hard to see now just as that uh, snow gets away from that radar, but that will continue as we head through the night tonight. There's that area of low pressure in behind it. We do have another one just on its heels. That's going to bring potentially uh, some heavy snow for parts of central. Uh, we do have a special weather statement in effect right now for the west coast all the way through to uh, essentially Clarenville could see again, as I said, upwards of about 25 centimeters of snow. That snowfall warning still in place for the northern peninsula. You'll see things calm down as you head towards the morning hours, but I'll have all the forecast details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. At this moment in Conception Bay South, the town is unveiling its financial plan for the new year. The budget for 2020 includes a plan to keep taxes at current levels and to try to encourage new home construction. Cease Hair reports. This budget almost sounds too good to be true. No tax increases for residents. No water tax increases. They've got their spending under control. Actually, spending is down. The only thing CBS is missing is roads paved with gold. There are no tax increases for businesses either. The mayor of the province's second largest municipality says they've managed to reduce spending despite rising costs. We've seen all kinds of increases in costs. Uh, 
Uh, our water costs, for example, has gone up significantly. Our uh, electricity rates have gone up over, the, over time. Our tipping fees have gone up. So all of these have extra costs. So we've been able, able to absorb, the, absorb them by doing things around the town hall and saving money. The town also saved a million dollars in debt payments due to lower interest as a result of borrowing nothing in the last couple of years. And it went after the money it was owed. You know, we had an aggressive uh, people who owed taxes to the town. We were very aggressive in collecting some of that this year. I think that worked out to about $700,000, for example. This steady-as-she-goes budget also sets aside money for traffic calming, 24-7 snow clearing, and sidewalks around schools for the thousands of elementary students who walk. There's also an incentive to see more homes built in the town. A building permit fee elimination will encourage more people to build and live in our beautiful community and make it easier for them to do so through the through an average savings of approximately $400, $450 for each home built. CBS has 81 new home starts this year. That's 20% of the total starts in Stats Canada's St. John's metro area. Cease here, CBC News, CBS. Classes were cancelled today at St. Anne's School in Con River as the Miapukek First Nation mourns the sudden death of its school principal. Velma Piercy is being remembered today as a warm-hearted and hard-working member of her community. Chief Michelle Joe could not confirm Piercy's cause of death to CBC News and he says he doesn't want to speculate. Grief counselors and mental health supports are available for grieving students, staff, as well as other members of the community. Police have charged a man from Angli with counseling to commit murder. According to police, the 40-year-old man asked somebody to kill another person in the neighboring community of Roddickton. The man will remain in custody until a court appearance next month in St. Anthony, and police would not comment on the relationship between the man charged and the person he allegedly wanted dead. Well, some more information tonight about a woman who was found on the side of a road in Conception Bay South last summer. The woman was found badly injured and she later died in hospital. Until now, the RNC has said little about her death. Here now's Ariana Kellen has more. Her name was Shanna Halloran, a 36-year-old woman, the mother of a young boy. And on August 15th, she was found badly injured on the side of Minerals Road in Conception Bay South. Halloran later died in hospital. Until now, the RNC has said little about her death, except that it was suspicious. In response to questions from CBC News, the RNC confirms Halloran was struck by a vehicle, but it has not been ruled a homicide nor a hit and run. Those details are still part of an ongoing investigation. It also hasn't been confirmed that being struck by a vehicle caused her death. Ariana Kellen, CBC News, St. John's. There's a vigil in Happy Valley Goose Bay tonight to remember a woman who was found dead near the town last week. And as people remember her, the Nunatsiavut government in Labrador is calling for an investigation into her death. 23-year-old Tama Bennett was found dead in a tent near Happy Valley Goose Bay on November the 15th. She was an Inuk woman from Nain and staying in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Police told the media her death was not deemed to be suspicious, but Nunatsiavut President Johannes Lamp believes the RCMP jumped to conclusions. Bennett had been a frequent client at the Housing Hub, an emergency shelter in Happy Valley Goose Bay that's operated by the Nunatsiavut government. The government would like the police to do a more detailed investigation. Meanwhile, the vigil I mentioned, that starts in about 20 minutes at the Labrador Friendship Center parking lot. An embattled Mount Pearl Headstone Company is now bankrupt. A judge issued the bankruptcy order for W.D. Kenny Granite this morning. Earlier this year, a CBC News investigation revealed that the company had come under fire, accused by customers of taking their money and not providing promised services. The company had been in receivership since September when a trustee moved in and changed the locks. Well, my colleague Carolyn Stokes joins me in the studio tonight. So, Carolyn, what are you going to have for us later on the show? 
Well, Anthony, we will explore the gender gap in the ocean industry. This morning, we visited the Marine Institute to speak with a rare breed of student, women studying to be mariners. We'll meet two young women in the Nautical Science Program, which is the same program that Captain Charlene Munden graduated from at the Marine Institute. We met Captain Munden in a feature Terry Roberts brought us yesterday, and we'll talk about the big demand for all types of workers in the marine industry. Anthony? Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, we're going to shift to St. John's right now. Keeping the downtown streets clear of snow is going to cost the city a lot more money this year. And here's why. Municipalities can no longer dump snow in harbors. Longtime practice in cities such as St. John's, Ottawa is enforcing federal regulations which don't allow snow to be dumped in the ocean because it often contains harmful materials such as plastic. So the city will truck snow from the downtown area to the Robin Hood Bay landfill in the east end. And that is going to triple snow clearing costs to more than $850,000. We've, uh, we've accounted for it in, in this year's uh, upcoming budget. It was something that we knew was coming. Uh, but, you know, it is an additional cost. I mean, $600,000 of estimate right now is, is a significant amount of money. So uh, we, uh, we had to make the adjustment. It is a federal regulation that we, uh, requirement that we have to meet. So uh, it has to be done. It's not, uh, not any choice involved in it. Newfoundland Labrador has an antibiotics problem. We use these drugs too much, more than anywhere else in Canada, and it's having dire consequences. Overuse leads to drug-resistant infections, and those are infections which could be fatal. Here now as Mark Quinn reports. We're using too many of these, and a recent report says the results across Canada have been disastrous. 14,000 uh, deaths per year in 2018 were associated with antimicrobial resistance to, and a cost to the government of $1.4 billion. So we know that antimicrobial resistance is increasingly a problem. This province has the highest rate of antibiotic use in the country. Healthcare providers say two groups need to be targeted to solve the problem. First is patients. They're driving up demand for the drugs. We see stories of patients who go to their family physician, ask for an antibiotic, get refused, and then go to a second doctor trying to get the antibiotic that they want. So this double doctoring reflects a particular demand from the patient side that they feel that they must have an antibiotic. Then there's the supply side. Doctors, they're the gatekeepers, but sometimes they're prescribing antibiotics when they shouldn't be. We're trying to empower the physician to take the time to explain to the patient why an antibiotic is not necessary and in fact may be harmful in many cases. But there's a tension between the patient who comes expecting a certain treatment and the doctor who knows that scientifically the treatment is not necessary but does sometimes bend to the patient's demand to take a cer certain drug. It's a problem that many like Health Minister John Hagee have seen coming for a long time. Overuse is making the antibiotics we have ineffective, but new antibiotics aren't being developed. The drug companies have stopped investing drug research money in antibiotics because they don't make them any money. He says that could mean that some life-changing procedures that we now take for granted could be lost. Ultimately, a lot of the progress uh, in surgery, certainly in planned surgery, uh, around hips and, and joints and prosthetics, has been made possible by the use of antibiotics, and that's in jeopardy if those antibiotics no longer work. Dr. Daly and Healthcare Minister John Hagee are among a group of academics and healthcare providers who will be here at MUN on Wednesday evening at 5.30 to discuss these problems and hopefully find some solutions. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. The Department of Municipal Affairs and Environment says the province-wide ban on plastic bags is set to come into effect by the middle of next year. A representative from the department told CBC News that the new regulations are almost complete. Customers are encouraged to start getting into the habit of bringing reusable bags when you go shopping and businesses can begin finding alternatives to plastic bags. While well, the provincial government is dismissing an opposition claim that big spending cuts are coming. The Tories say the Liberal government plans to cut more than $600 million from the provincial budget starting as early as March, but the government, they claim, is refusing to talk about it. The opposition says that would amount to the loss of hundreds of public service jobs and hundreds of millions in health care cuts to meet the government's promise to have a surplus budget by 2022-23. 
We'll know more about that when a mid-year financial update is released in a couple of weeks. But the finance minister says there is no big plan to start cutting. The reality is, um, you know, we've never said we were going to uh, close hospitals in order to achieve uh, the, the uh, efficiencies that are needed uh, in order to return the surplus. So do you even have cuts on that scale in the plans, given that you're sort of softening the commitment to the balanced budget? No, we don't. The union representing Dominion workers says it's considering going on strike before Christmas. Unifor says contract talks with Loblaws have broken down and it's asking the government to appoint a conciliator. The union says it's concerned that the company is cutting full-time jobs in favor of part-time jobs which have fewer benefits. Unifor says it will speak with members directly and may distribute strike votes. A spokesperson for Loblaws has said they won't be commenting in the media. Indicated under oath that he may not have been in the loop. Not in the loop, but $900,000 richer. My next guest says Nalcor shouldn't have paid former VP Derek Sturge a penny. That interview just ahead.
first taste of nasty winter conditions today on the West mm. Coast. Some schools uh, certainly delayed. I think even some closed. Might be wrong about that, but I, I heard they had quite a mess on the West Coast with all that freezing rain you mentioned last night. Absolutely. Yeah, we saw that earlier this morning, earlier this afternoon. Temperatures did finally bump up above zero, though, which was good news because everything changed. Melted off a bit. Yeah, and yeah. changed over to rain and or snow really is what right. happened. So we'll take a look at those temperatures. That's where you were hovering. So it's still quite a chilly afternoon, but again, those temperatures bumping up above zero allowed that freezing rain to fall as just rain uh, through the day for areas like Deer Lake uh, towards Cornerbrook as well. Stephenville sitting at four degrees and take a look at this temperature for St. John's reached a high near 11 degrees. If you haven't been outside in the last couple of hours, you uh, might want to go outside. Nice day uh, so far that just jumped up. And uh, those temperatures maybe a degree more before we start to see a dip down. Uh, through the overnight tonight. Temperatures currently sitting at about minus eight for Happy Valley Goose Bay, Nain at minus two, and uh, Lab City sitting at minus six. So here's uh, what's going on as far as that future track. We do have that area of low pressure it's just sitting over us right now. Uh, the center of it really is over central for the most part. Have that area of snow to the north, that freezing rain or ice pellet line uh, just to this around Green Bay, White Bay area. You're still going to see a wintry mix as we head through the night tonight. Otherwise, anything south of that, south and east of that, will be some showers and or drizzle through the overnight. And then uh, some rain or flurries along the west coast as well as the uh, remainder of that system moves through. Overnight tonight, Labrador is pretty quiet other than the southeastern portion of Labrador. You're still looking at that snow with that special weather statement in effect. You're still looking at another 10 or rather totals of 10 to 15 centimeters of snow by morning. So here's where you'll be hovering overnight. Four degrees in Corner Brook. Light winds along the west coast, but uh, west southwesterlies along the northeast coast. And you're looking at uh, gusts anywhere from 40 to 60 kilometers per hour. That temperature will drop to about four degrees for St. John's. Hanging on to this drizzly weather, uh, minus three for Happy Valley Goose Bay and Lab City. You're going to sit at minus nine with those uh, breezy northwesterlies overnight tonight. Tomorrow that low moves off, but as you can see by these wind particles here, uh, we get back into that onshore flow and that means uh, RDF it looks like through the day. So expect uh, a generally gray day across the province for the most part with again that onshore drizzle continuing in some uh, patchy fog as well. South Coast best chance of seeing some afternoon peaks of sun. You won't see sunshine all day, but you might see a few peaks of sun and then up through Labrador pretty quiet. Just some coastal flurries will be possible through the day. Then our next weather maker moves in on Thursday. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but uh, here's your temperatures for tomorrow. Much cooler than today, especially in St. John's. Five degrees will be the afternoon high. You'll see those winds shift from northwesterly to northeasterly, hence the drizzle through the day. Uh, three degrees for Clarenville. Same for uh, Grand Falls, Windsor. Hanging on to that potential uh, for some drizzle as well and either flurries or showers in the first half of the day. Staying cloudy with again some peaks of sun possible along the south coast. Uh, St. Anthony, some flurries uh, and or light snow in the morning. Generally staying cloudy though through the day. Same for areas like Mary's Harbor and Cartwright. And then as we head a little bit further uh, Further west, Lab City, you're sitting around minus five tomorrow. Those winds generally light, but again, can't rule out the chance of a few flurries. So that's a look at that forecast for tomorrow. Again, next weather maker moves in, that special weather statement in effect. I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, Nalcor says it had no choice but to pay top executive Derek Sturge $900,000 when it showed him the door last week. Sturge worked as VP Finance for just under 14 years, but Nalcor added in six years when Sturge worked for Hydro between 1989 and 1996, bringing his years of service to 20. His severance entitled him to 12 months pay, his annual salary of $325,000. Then a month for each year of service to a certain limit, the vacation time pension, $575,000. A $900,000 golden handshake for Nalcor's VP Finance, one of the key witnesses at the Muskrat Falls inquiry. Yeah, I mean, there were times, it was a big project, it's a complicated organization. I'd say there were times that we were out of the loop. You know, whether it's purposely or not, it's hard to know. Well, putting aside the severance formula, my next guest says Nalcor should not have been so generous with Mr. Sturge. Des Sullivan is an outspoken Nalcor critic, author of the Uncle Gnarly blog, blog rather, and he joins us uh, now. Uh, thanks for coming in. Nice to be here. $900,000 golden handshake. What's your assessment? Well, my assessment is that Nalcor had an obligation, number one, to the people of the province who have just invested so far, 
and the final number is not in, but they've invested so far $16 million uh, in, an, in an inquiry that is being undertaken on, f with regard to Nalcor, with regard to Muskrat Falls. This is not a good project. This was a, uh, a debacle, a, 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 an economic disaster for the province that has seriously affected uh, the, the Treasury. That has to be kept in mind. Number two, Nalcor had a responsibility to wait until the report of the, of the Commission of Inquiry, which is coming in just a few weeks from now. You mean to wait before giving this $900,000? Absolutely, be before even considering that, because if they wanted to make a decision with regard to the future of Mr. Sturge, don't forget that they did not have any obligation at that point to pay out Mr. Sturge. It was their own assertion that they were legally obligated to. Well, as I said, without cause. Well, right? but it was only when that decision was made by the board of directors or by uh, the, the Nelcor senior people right. that the obligation came into play. So they made that decision that Mr. Sturge would go without cause. So you're saying they could have just fired him and then gone to court? Or? Abs absolutely. Uh, uh, there was considering... Uh, what has gone on at the Muskrat Falls inquiry, it would not have been uh, unreasonable at all for Nalcor to have said, uh, with all due respect, Mr. Sturge, we have, uh, we have a court system here. If you feel that you're entitled, take, take us to court. Tell, the, tell your story to a judge. We have due process. There's nothing wrong with that in the kind of circumstance that we are in today. You have a corporation that has had a disastrous project having so far spent $12.7 billion. And if you uh, look at Dave Bernie's math, you'll get closer to $13.7 billion. It's a debacle. And Nelcor can ignore the commission of inquiry, can ignore the investment of public money that has gone into it, to this inquiry or what they as a corporation, owe oh, the people of this province and say, oh, we'll just write a check without cause for another $900 million, over no. $900,000. Right. That's unacceptable. But don't forget that Mr. Sturge appeared at the inquiry. Mm -hmm. He gave sworn testimony. He indicated under oath that he, he may was. not have been in the loop yeah. when certain critical decisions came down, in particular the question of $300 million uh, of cost overruns prior to financial close, when that was the point at right. which basically in the, in the project where the federal, uh, the, the, all of the conditions, conditions precedent to the federal loan guarantee were met and they could, have t they could take down the loan or they could walk it back and say, hey, we're already $300 million over budget, we'll, we'll review no. this, but none of that happened. No and, doubt. And, and Mr. Sturge admits that he wasn't in the loop on this. Well, he was CFO. All right, no doubt we'll be talking a lot about this once the inquiry <laughs> reports. Des Hullum, appreciate you coming in. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. We're, we're in dire need of every officer, doesn't matter if it's male or female. Captain Charlene Munden navigates her career through a marine industry dominated by men, but find out what's being done to change that and meet the next generation that's ahead on Here and Now.
back to the program. First, we start with breaking news. Temperatures are dropping into the minus single digits. Time now to check in with our Carolyn Stokes. It is just packed with people. The company says it's picking up salmon. Looks like an absolutely gorgeous afternoon. Well, welcome back. Last night, we brought you the story of Captain Charlene Munden, a female ship's officer from the Buren Peninsula, setting a new course in the marine industry. Just a tiny fraction of people who work in this industry are women. In tonight's follow-up, Terry Roberts looks at why that is and what's being done about it. See that uh, green buoy down there? Yes. Captain Charlene Munden is not the first woman to captain a big ship. But scenes like this, a woman at the helm, are extremely rare. Right now, we've got uh, 20 on board and there's three women and the rest are men. The other two are cooks. There are more than a million mariners in the world. Just 2% are women. And that's part of the reason why there's such a serious labor shortage throughout the industry. We're in dire need of every officer, doesn't matter if it's male or female. So why is there such a massive gender gap? Partly, you can blame tradition. It is an industry that has traditionally attracted men. There's a, a sense that uh, the sector is uh, very physical. The Chamber of Marine Commerce is trying to change that image. It means countering a culture that once believed it was bad luck to have a woman on board a working ship. Sometimes men haven't been as accommodating uh, in, in their workplace to accept women. So the industry wants to change attitudes. We are working with our existing crew members uh, to train them up and to be more accommodating of um, lots of new people coming on board, not just women. Another turnoff for many is the extended time away from home. Some sailors can be gone for months at a time, and that can be hard on family, and even more so on a woman who wants to have children. But that too is changing. We're changing our scheduling. Uh, to make it much more accommodating so people aren't uh, forced to be out at sea, uh, as it were, uh, for too long a time and they are given lots of uh, leave opportunities to come back on shore, be with their families. That's good news for Captain Munden. I have all intentions of going back to work after, but I think it's going to be pretty hard. She gave birth to her first child last month. James Cody Munden doesn't know it yet, but he's about to become a sailor. Oh, I think I'm going to bring him out when I can have them on board with me. It's success stories like Charlene Munden's that the industry wants to promote. And it's fun to navigate these ships and, and you know we find that women are, are enjoying uh, just being able to address that challenge, meet the challenge of navigating through difficult uh, waterways like the Thousand Islands and they get through that and they go wow that's quite the experience. It's more than an experience. It's very well paid, uh, surprisingly well paid. For CBC News, I'm Terry Roberts. Well, some students who will uh, soon graduate from the Marine Institute hope to plot the same course as Captain Munden. There are 25 students on track to graduate from the Nautical Science Program this year, and only four of them are women. This morning, I met Abby Plough and Katie Barker. What did you think when you saw Captain Charlene Munden? Oh, I was amazed, <laughs> yeah. especially um, like being pregnant on the boat and having a family. It shows us that you can you can do both. Mm -hmm. That's it's an amazing story. Yeah, it's definitely encouraging for us as well. Mm -hmm. What do you think would need to happen to encourage more women to get involved? You know, I guess seeing Captain uh, Munden is an encouragement for you. Is there anything that the industry itself can do to uh, you know actively get more women out there? Well, I think it's after changing a lot. The culture is definitely changing. Um, before, if you walked on a boat, you would have been the only girl, and for most of the times we are, but the very few times I've walked on board the bridge and there was female mates sitting down and I'd see them, and that's, it's nice to know that you know there is mates there and I can get to that point. Are you guys in the same class? Yes. yes. And when you look around your classroom, are there any other women there, or is it just you two? Um, it's just us. And what's that like? for you, you know, entering into a career that is largely dominated by men? I don't find it bad at all. I think all of the guys that I work with have been great. Um, I've never found it to be anything too intimidating. We already did 360 days at sea, mm -hmm. so I think the main thing is just being confident in yourself. And if you're confident in yourself, the other guys will believe in you as well. Why do you want to do this? 
I don't want to work in an office and I love sailing and so it's it's a good combination and it's so rewarding it's so cool you get to see so many things you get to go so many places there's great time off of course you do work a long time but you get almost equal time off so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this uh, I love to travel and I love being faced with challenges every day no day is the same so I like that aspect of the job and I like the people that you meet. Every boat you're going to come across different people and I think that's very rewarding. I'm the Senior Placement Officer at the Marine Institute. So we match uh, students with employers. So what are you seeing by way of demand out there? Yeah, in the marine industry there's a number of factors that come together. The demographics, the aging population of the workforce, and the expansion of the marine industry has uh, created a situation where there's a strong demand uh, employers are, even, are very keen on equity groups as well, so uh, there's even initiatives being put in place to you know, increase the recruitment efforts of you know, females, aboriginals, persons with disabilities. Well, you've seen in the piece that you know, uh, women are moving through the ranks and there's a strong demand, so you know, we want people from all areas and all across sections of society because it just makes it a better industry. And why does it make it a better industry? Well, I think it would just, you know, brings different perspectives, uh, you know, to, to the bridge and to the ship environment. Why do you think there aren't more women getting involved in the marine industry? You don't mm. see it as much, I don't mm. think. Where when we were growing up, I, there probably wasn't as many females. Now there is more. So I think as time goes on, there will be more females. And when you see it and when it's exposed, I think girls will say, oh, I want to do that. You just don't see it on, the, on social media or anything. If you're a woman and you're heading out to sea, you're out on the ocean for long stretches of time, do you think that's a deterrent for some women who may want to start a family? Uh, absolutely, I would say. Um, but I think, uh, well, just on that in interview or that story that we read on Charlene London, mm -hmm. like she manages to, to get along with it and I've heard of other females who have just managed as well, but I definitely it is hard and I would say it is a deterrent, absolutely. What is your ultimate goal? Ooh, that's good. Um, well, I guess to become a captain and then, I don't know, I want to stay in the industry, but I obviously also want a family, so I'm gonna have to, my goal is to somehow balance that. Um, right now, I would love to be on like some sort of research vessel, but... For me, um, I'd like to kind of do the same thing as Abby, be a skipper one day on a boat, but as well the family aspect. Um, but I would like to stay in the offshore industry. That's where I've done all my work terms, and I really like um, all the aspects of the offshore industry. But with this career, there are so many different positions you can go into. There's so many opportunities with this career. Now they still have about six months before they graduate the nautical science program and enter the workforce and uh, both say they have no worries whatsoever about finding a job.
Welcome back to Here and Now. At a fish plant in Arnold's Cove, there's a new piece of equipment that makes it a lot easier to remove the bones from a codfish. Now it's called FlexiCut and Ice Water Seafoods bought the machine as part of a big investment in the plant to improve its cod processing technology. Here's a look at what it does and how it works. Okay, well we're in year two of a three year $10 million investment plan for Arnold's Cove. And FlexiCut is a piece of technology developed in Iceland by a company called Morel. And the main focus is removing the pin bone or the V-cut as some people call it in a cod fillet. But they've also made an attachment called Flexi Sort, which actually, after it cuts the fillet, it starts distributing the fillet. So basically, the main purpose is, is to remove the V-bone and do some portioning of the fillet. So basically, uh, a year ago, the first phase of our $10 million investment, we bought brand new state-of-the-art bought our heading, filleting, and skinning machines. And the other thing you'll see in, when you enter the plant with me is you saw a lot of slush ice everywhere. I mean, you know, ideally when a fisherman catch fish, it should be four degrees or colder, and then we want to maintain it at four degrees or colder. So going into our heading machines, the fish should be about zero. It's four minutes from the time it gets to the head, it goes through the heading machine until it's through our flexi sort, sort machine, and we try to keep it at four or below. That's what our customers want. So uh, it's all about, you know, the heading machine has to do the best job it can so that the fiddling machine can do the best job it can, so that the skinning machine can do the best job it can. And then we have our pre-trimmers. So the pre-trimmers, they get a skinless fillet, and their job is to make sure that there's no bones, parasites, or blood spots in the fillet. And it's called pre-trimming because they're then sending the fillet to the flexi-cut and the flexi-sort for it to do its work. And the flexi-sort, of I mean, the other thing with flexi-cut, it has, it's based on x-ray technology. So it's scanning each fillet, it's looking where the pin bones are or the V-cut, and it's deciding how to cut each fish. So each fish is cut differently based on what the machine or what each fillet, the dynamics of each fillet. And you use pretty much the entire fish. We actually, we say that we sell 99.8% of the, the weight we buy, we sell 99.8%, whether it's for pet food on the low end to the highest premium product on the high end. I'm the seventh generation of our family and the eighth generation just joined. I mean, uh, it's all we know, I guess, you know, we're in the cod business. Uh, when other plants, fo you know, focus on crab or shrimp, we stuck with cod. I mean, this plant since 1979 has focused on cod production. We survived the moratorium. When we didn't, didn't have any local fish, we bought in frozen at sea raw material. Now we're back to local fish. We say we have 215 cod experts here. They don't know nothing about shrimp. They don't know nothing about crab, but they know a lot about cod. Amazing technology. In national, I should say international American news, public hearings continue today in Washington at the impeachment inquiry of Donald Trump. And three of today's witnesses were on that crucial phone call with the president of Ukraine, including Alex Alexander Vindman, a decorated soldier and the top Ukraine expert at the U.S. National Security Council. As well, Jennifer Williams, a Foreign Service veteran and current aide to Vice President Mike Pence. Here's some of what they had to say today. I found the July 25th phone call unusual. I was concerned by the call. What I heard was inappropriate. Now that phone conversation sparked the whistleblower complaint that led to the impeachment inquiry in the U.S., in American Congress, I should say, a concern that President Trump was attempting to pressure a foreign power to investigate the family of political rival Joe Biden. Trump weighed in as the hearing was underway, calling it a disgrace. Well, prosecutors in the United States have charged two correctional officers who were on duty the night convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein took his own life. The two guards are charged with falsifying prison records and they were responsible for checking on Epstein every half hour. Prosecutors say security camera footage shows that Epstein was alone in his cell the night that he killed himself. And they say the guards were sleeping and browsing the internet when they were supposed to be watching him. Epstein was in the facility facing child sex trafficking charges. Authorities ruled his death was a suicide.
Clyde Oxford, the one-handed fisherman who finds ways to get things done, by hook or by crook. Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. Okay, so let's look ahead a little bit yeah. uh, to what, late Wednesday, Thursday? That's exactly what we're going to do because okay. we do have uh, our next weather maker knocking on our doorstep. All right, bring as, it. <laughs> as per usual. Let's take a look at the future tracker. So this one is going to be a little bit of a messy uh, situation. We'll see some showers move in late day along the south coast and then quickly into the afternoon on Thursday. That turns into a wintry mix. So. Right now it does look like the rain snow line will uh, set up somewhere in central. Again, it's still a little bit early models, not completely agreeing on exactly where that's going to happen. Anything uh, just to I'd say the west of that line will more than likely be snow and anything east of that will be rain. Could see some heavy rain at times overnight Thursday and uh, into Friday as well as the system kind of sticks around for a little bit, especially along the northeast coast. And again, that special weather statement is already in effect. It was actually issued yesterday. Uh, and we are looking at some models pointing to upwards of 25 centimeters. That bullseye, again, not very well agreed upon, but there is a good chance we could see upwards of uh, 25 centimeters of snow. We'll certainly keep an eye on that for tomorrow. The special weather statement is in effect from the west coast pretty much through to uh, Clarenville, Bonavista, uh, Buren Peninsula, and the Avalon. Uh, again, mainly going to see a rain event. Now, over the next couple of days, we are certainly in for a, I'd say, pretty active pattern over the next couple of days. Here's uh, what the temperatures are going to be sitting at for Thursday. And with this system, it's going to bring some rain as well. So four degree or uh, rather windy conditions as well. Four degrees for St. John's hovering uh, in the single digits, five degrees for Marystown. And you're looking at uh, minus single digits up through Happy Valley Goose Bay. Now. The reason for uh, the active pattern is very much where the jet stream is, and that's the winds in the upper level that act like a conveyor belt, and that's what moves the systems around. And the way that that jet stream is right now is bringing them right up the pipe. So that's going to continue. If we take a look at the future track, you can see it's pretty much one after the other. Friday, that moves out. Next system moves in on Saturday. That moves out. Next system moves in uh, for Monday, and that one looks like it's going to continue right into uh, Tuesday afternoon. So we certainly are in for lots of weather over the next couple of days. And uh, depending on those temperatures, it'll be an either rain or snow event. So here's where we're sitting for uh, central Newfoundland into uh, the next couple of days, two, three degrees right across the board with either rain or snow. Again, that's because where that rain snow line sets up will be determining where that happens. Now, best chance of seeing potentially a few peaks of sun, but more than likely staying Cloudy will be uh, Friday, four degrees, but again, two to four degrees right across the board. Uh, for Eastern Labrador, you're looking at some flurries tomorrow and then cloudy conditions continuing both Thursday and Friday. That uh, potential for some snow will move back in for the weekend. And then we've got Western Labrador sitting around minus five tomorrow, pretty much hovering around that for the majority of the week and some heavier snow uh, likely for both Saturday and Sunday with your temperatures hovering in the minus single digits. So that's a look at your forecast. I'll we'll have your weather photo coming up. Well, thanks, Ashley. In international news now, police in Hong Kong have made over 1,000 arrests in the past 24 hours as the number of anti-government protesters holed up in a university have dwindled. However, there are still about 100 who are believed to still be inside, some with serious injuries. Outside, this engineer was among dozens of supporters who turned up to pray for the students' safety. All of them are trapped inside uh, the university and many of them are trying to stay there. They're really willing to die for that. It's really heartbreaking and we don't trust the police. Police say nearly 800 people who left the campus earlier would be investigated. Nearly 300 are said to be under the age of 18. And this evening, a few small groups tried to break out, but they returned when police confronted them. And the whereabouts, the Canadian side of this story, the whereabouts of some Canadians who are believed to be among the demonstrators are not known right now. Hong Kong police say many detainees have been charged in connection. Uh, with these protests for shooting arrows and hurling Molotov cocktails. Officials say 235 injured people were taken to hospital today. 
Well, back here to Canada now, thousands of CN rail workers have walked off the job. And the strike comes after months of negotiating with little progress. Workers claim their health and safety is at risk. The company says job cuts are necessary because business is down. Uh, the strike is still young. Uh, the company still has plenty of time to change their attitude at the bargaining table. The safety issues and the uh, issues relating to the health of our members that we've raised at the bargaining table have fallen on deaf ears. And these are issues that absolutely need to be resolved. Well, the strike began at midnight last night. Industry was quick to react with mining companies predicting dire consequences and job losses if the strike goes on. Oil producers also warned that they rely on CN Rail to get product to market. And for farmers, the strike comes during a late harvest season. The federal labor minister says she's monitoring talks and is hopeful that the two sides will soon reach a deal. We want to know where you're to. Take a look at this dramatic sky. Sunset. Pretty nice. Kind of hard to tell where that is. Pretty hard to spot. <laughs> uh, beautiful wherever it is. Yes. I'll tell you where this is to when we come back. Welcome back. Now, brace yourself for another Christmas story. Another one? <laughs> another one. <laughs> and uh, what may be the most bling-covered tree that you're ever going to see. Check this out. It's literally lovely. The lights are amazing. Yeah, and for good. Christmas, it's the best thing you really want to see. I can stay here all day long and stare it. Well, eat your heart out, Rockefeller Center, New York. It took days to drape this tree with thousands of tiny Swarovski crystals. Wow, beautiful. This park in Copenhagen is famous for its elaborate gardens, and a one-of-a-kind tree fits right in. Thousands and thousands of crystals. That is stunning. Kind of pretty. I want that one in my house. Look at that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I might have to make a bit of room for it, but you just sort of check it out. Kind of magical crystals all over the place and glitter and twinkling. That is a lot of, yeah.
That is the most expensive tinsel in the world. I don't know right about you, there. but I'm getting excited. You finally getting the Christmas spirits? Yeah, I can't getting there? Wait. Okay, good. I'm really excited. Well, that's good. Yeah, <laughs> the Santa parade this weekend. That's right. So that's when things officially get Kick get off. going for Christmas, right? That's right, absolutely. When the old Saint Nick shows up. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Crystal's kind of pretty, but you also had a really great picture. I did take a look at this photo. Now uh, you can't really see it Are in there. Are there any any clues no, in this isn't. at all? And there would be some clues if it was maybe a little bit lighter and you saw all the snow, but no, it's uh, taken uh, just outside of Goose Bay. Uh, the uh, yeah, crossing over the Churchill River. Outside of Goose Bay. Outside of Goose Bay. So Lindsay uh, Morehouse sent us that wonderful photo. Thank you so much for sending that in. And if uh, you have any gorgeous shots to send us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Excellent. Thanks, Lindsay. So yeah. I was going to ask you. So, are you a good like organized shopper at Christmas, or like are you done yet? Are you no? No. Okay. I want to every year. I want to do it, but I end up. December like 23rd, 24th out there shopping oh, okay. every time. I gotta all break right. that habit. I'm the best procrastinator. Yeah, I'll give you my list. Okay. It's all right. <laughs> Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Spirit.